linear hypothesis and we talked about uh, uh, population and some parametric form of the hypothesis and then how we used um, basically sample estimates to to see whether the sample uh, constitutes some sort of evidence for the alternative. And we are still in a sort of uh, illustrative and intuitive examples. And we saw that there was a very good idea to look at this construction here. So it's, it's the x bar minus, well, mu zero, you might say. Divided by s over the square root of n, and this is the value from so my h zero claims a particular value for the um, for the mu. So if I put this here, I get this um, standard normal distribution for t. And we saw that uh, we have the standard normal distribution, then some values are completely in line with that distribution. So they are completely in line with the truth of H0, while other observations are in strong conflict with the H0 or with the N01 distribution. So these are strong indication that H0 is not correct. Uh, yeah, that's more or less what we came to. So, yeah. And we can introduce a concept called p-values into this because that's gonna measure somehow the degree of conflict between the observation and H0 being true. So it's a very intuitive uh, concept, actually. Um, you can find an intuitive place to put it. Yeah. I take away this. So H zero true implies distributed like something which is standard normal zero one oh, one two and so on and we might observe T ops up here and we say that this is in a striking uh, conflict with the distribution. And how do we see this? Well, we can talk about what is the probability of observing something like we did or even more upwards here. So we observe something, and what's the probability of that happening given, given H0 is true? Well, that's fairly easy to evaluate, because if H0 is true, T would have a, a standard normal. So if this is 3.93, then we can go to some software or use some table to compute this probability and you find that it's about 0 0.00043 which is about 0 I would say. So the probability of observing something as far up as we did for T is basically 0 given that A0 is true. 
So if I'm observing something with almost a probability zero based on some assumption, I start to doubt my assumptions, right? So you see, and this is exactly what we call a p-value for this test. It's a very central concept that we will talk about probably every week from now on, p-value. Um, so consider, for instance, This other observation that was uh, here at something like seven, zero point seven nine or something. What's the p-value corresponding to that observation? It's going to be this probability. It's not pro it's not particularly low, so I would estimate something like zero point three or something. So I've observed something with a probability 30%. That's not going to shake my confidence in the foundations, right? But if I observe something with this probability, I start to get very suspicious. So a low p-value means our observations are in contradiction to H0. And the lower it gets, the, more is the stronger is the contradiction. So you see that when we get out, when we move over here in this direction with our t observed, at some point we'll decide to switch from believing in H0 to say H0 is probably wrong. I'd rather believe in this one. Okay. So maybe we can summarize this example, because we need to rework this a little bit more thoroughly. Um, so the hypothesis where in this particular case for a parameter mu, uh, the alternative was the claim that they were cheating on their meat. Uh, so it's mu greater than 10 while the null hypothesis was that they were in the law. And the object was sort of to seek statistical evidence for H1. And the procedure is to take a sample to compute the estimates, x bar and s. Then. We, maybe we start here, we investigate what is the distribution for t as a random variable if h0 is true. This is called a sampling distribution, or it's called a null distribution actually for t. Okay, so we, we say in this case, this null distribution was standard normal. Then I compute what this was I actually observing with my sample. And then I just try to measure or to say, was my observation reasonable given that H or if H0 is true? So we compare the observed value to what is the distribution if H0 is true, like we did. And the, the sort of. Uh, what is called the hard evidence is the p-value, which measures, in a way, the reasonability of the observation along with the distribution here. So it, it's, we say that it's not reasonable to observe something with a probability like this. It doesn't, that happens too rarely. OK, so yeah, I think we just have to work through this more general framework and then see how far we get. 
So we're going to rediscover or re be more general about the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The test statistic will be different according to what kind of parameters we are dealing with and also sample sizes and so on. We need to discuss something which I swept under the carpet here, something called critical direction relating to p-values. Uh, something called significance level, which I have not talked about. Um, we will understand there's a, that the H0 and the H1 are playing somewhat different roles. So we say they are asymmetrical in a way. And we discuss briefly types of mistakes that we can make when we uh, decide in a hypothesis test. So obviously I, I take my sample, I do some computations, and I decide, or I say, I think this is wrong, I believe this one. But that, I'm, I'm not necessarily correct. I'm using a small sample of a large population, so there's always a possibility of making mistakes. And there are two of them which we will need to know a little bit about. That's more or less the program for the rest of the lecture. Um, so typically, we start with the alternative hypothesis. And this is usually something we want to prove. So it's some claim that we wish to prove statistically. So if my parameter is called beta, which it could be, it could be beta greater than 20, beta less than 20, or beta different than 20. It's usually one of these three alternatives. So this would be a one H1 alternative. Um, The null hypothesis is something contrary to, to H1. It doesn't have to be the logical opposite, but it has to be. So if H1 says beta greater than 20, we will very often see H0 being just beta equal to 20. Or it could be it will basically always be one of those two. But technically, we work on this form here. So the idea is we are trying to prove H1, but we initially assume H0 is true. So this, these are the hypotheses. The test statistic. Um, so we have a population. And we have some hypotheses, beta greater than 20. And we have a sample. And we have a test statistic. And this can be uh, different from test to test, depending on what we want to do. But it has to have two properties. It must have a known distribution when H0 is true. And that could be a normal distribution, or it could be something else. It's quite often it's a normal distribution. But we need to know this. So this is something random that we compute from the sample. But we need to know the distribution if H0 is true. And then secondly, an observed value must be computable from the sample data. So we need to be able to take our, say, x1, x2, xn, and make a number, which we can compare in this picture. Either it's something horrible or something good for H0. So that's the 
that's basically what the test statistic is. It's what we compute to decide the test. Okay, this one is uh, I thought that was a little bit yeah. So the critical direction is maybe not that difficult concept actually. <laughs> Simply, you have a test statistic T, and we say that some observation A for the T is more critical than another if. A is stronger evidence for the alternative than observing B. Okay. So clearly in the meat example we had mu greater than 10. This was the alternative. So clearly if you put 10 here then x bar in this direction gives stronger ev evidence for this. So if I put um, C here and D here, then this is stronger evidence for this than that for X bar. And so followingly, um, if I take X bar minus 10 divided by whatever S over square root of N, I would say that this critical direction for x bar, it sort of uh, yeah, it goes in the same direction in the in this scale, the normal standard normal scale. So 2.5 is more critical than 1.5, and so on. While any observation, it's quite important to realize that any observation down here, even very far out on that side, is not critical for, um, or it does not provide evidence for this one. Because that simply means that the x bar is maybe down here, for instance, and it's certainly not an indication that they are cheating, it's, it's an indication that they are economically stupid and uses too clean meat or something, but not cheating. So in this meat example, there's only one critical direction, and that is a higher value for x bar, and that's just for, for t. Um, and clearly, If my alternative was like this, I would have a critical, two critical directions, both upwards and downwards, right. on the t scale and on the x bar scale. We'll come back to this in certain examples. So to be more critical means just give stronger evidence for the alternative. Um, yeah, and then rephrasing and being more precise about the p-value. It can be defined generally as the probability. Okay, the first thing, you start by taking the sample. You try to figure out 
what's the distribution of t if h0 is true. And then compute the observed value that you got from your particular sample. And then compute the probability. So you get something, here should be 0. Uh, you get t ops. And if the critical direction happens to be that way, you compute the probability of being more critical than what you actually got. So it's this one. So what we did in the meet example was to say, OK, the critical direction is up here. Um, and the p-value must then be this probability. Now, you should realize at this point that we are now dealing with the theoretical stuff here. And uh, what will happen very often in this course is that we will work with SPSS. And then we can ask SPSS to do this kind of test as we did in the meet example. And then SPSS will just take your sample, which is then a column of numbers, sample meet percent. It will take those and think about it for a millisecond or a half a second. And then it will put out x bar s uh, something, and then a p value. Of course, you have to specify what are you testing and so on. And why we have to calculate each and every Like this? Yeah. We have to understand sometime what we. <laughs> what we do, I guess. So I cannot just tell you that we put push this button and that button in SPSS, and then you look at this value. And if this is less than something, you conclude like this and all the rest like that. I could tell you that, but I don't think it's a, a good path. But the project <laughs> is applied uh, statistics with uh, SPSS. The course title? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but we have to know what we are applying, right? So, um, we cannot just apply it without knowing anything, huh? Still, I think this course you will realize that it's more practical than many other courses that you took, or many other statistics courses. So I'm trying to keep this to the necessary minimum, I would say. And then one can discuss what is the necessary minimum. But I have my this definition. Right. So, I mean, the reason why we use SPSS for this is because it's very boring to look at these 50 numbers and then put it into a calculator or something and then find x bar and s. And then you have to put up some formula to compute x bar minus mu zero divided by s over n. Yeah. So it's just automating those processes, but we need to know what's going on, I think. We need to know a little bit about what's going on. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're cutting short on this issue. This is called significance level. This is actually um, related to the picture I showed you. So supposing we have a t statistic that is standard normal, um, something like this. Suppose this is the critical direction. And then I said, OK with increasing t values upwards here. At some point, we, we I mean, the, the evidence is getting stronger and stronger for h1. So it's, at some point, we should be satisfied and say, I don't believe in h0 anymore. I switch to, to 
So I go from H0 to H1. But it's not clear at the moment where to do that. So that is our significance level. And this is a pre-assigned value. So it's very commonly put here at 0 0.05. And then we say, OK, my limit here for accepting or for doing this switch from H0 to H1 is this significance level. So if my p value is less than alpha, we say that I don't believe anymore in H0. So this is a kind of a decision rule that we put up before we do the test. And then we would say that, OK, my, my uh, t happened to be here. But the alpha probability sits here. That would be set alpha then. So it's equivalent to set t ops being greater than set alpha in this case. Okay. Mm. So there are some topics that are just coming along now. Um, the asymmetry of the hypothesis in general is the fact that um, we try to prove H1. So uh, I shouldn't draw this picture. So we always start here. And then the question is, um, should we change our view from, from, from the initial H0 crew? So then we seek evidence, evidence from Delta. And we want it to be sufficiently strong. And sufficiently strong means basically p value less than what is our significance level. So the difference here is that we, um, we try to prove this one. And if if we can do that, it's OK. Then we just say that we believe this is true. But if we don't, or if we are not able to do that, we just keep this original hypothesis. But we don't try to prove this one. So we are not looking for sort of evidence for this or evidence for that. We are only trying to prove this. And if we can't do it, let's stay where we are. So the asymmetry is sometimes uh, compared to what you have in a lawsuit where the prosecutors and so on, they want to uh, have evidence for guilt, while the initial, I mean, the standard null hypothesis in this case is that the defendant is innocent. And if you cannot put up solid evidence of guilt, he stays innocent even though you haven't proved that he's innocent in that case. So this is an issue that is sometimes misunderstood while you read in newspapers and so, where someone does not find 
Um, someone doesn't find an effect of a medication, for instance, and then they say that it's proven that it doesn't have an effect. But that's not the case. It's just that they cannot prove the effect of this medicine. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have it. Right. So there's a difference. I cannot prove from here now that it's not raining outside. That doesn't mean it's not raining. Huh? Okay, we, we are actually probably going to make it to some few examples in the end. Um, yeah, there's something called type 1 and type 2 errors, and this is best understood in a diagram which looks something like this. Um, if you draw on the middle of the page, Something like this. And then we put here H0 true. And H1 true. Two lines. Now, this is the reality. This is the real situation down here. It either is H0 true or H1 is true. Um, and here we say we have two decisions. We keep H0 or we reject H0. So there are two possible realities, and we have two decisions that we make based on a small sample from some large group. So we look at our uh, test statistic, which happens to be a random variable and so on, so it may lead us to make some mistakes. Um, so if H0 is true and we keep H0, so we stay here and this is in line with the reality, it's okay. But if our test, if our sample, sometimes it happens that we unluckily sample 50 very fatty packets of meat just by accident and we, we are led to conclude falsely that H0 is true even though it in reality is true. Then we make a mistake, and this happens, and it's called a type 1 um, error. Yeah. Then on the other side, there's this case that H1 is true. And if we reject H0 and say that H0 is true, that's very OK. Then we did the right thing. but. Um, Sometimes we are in a situation where H1 is actually true, but our data does not provide the solid enough evidence, so we keep H0. Then we make a type 2 error. So to make a story short as possible, um, we consider these type 1 errors to be the most dangerous. We cannot avoid them completely, but we can control the probability of making such mistakes. And this probability is actually exactly what we call the significance level, right? So uh, how can I explain this? Well, let's assume that this is alpha equal to 0 0.05. And very briefly, so somewhere here we cut off 0 
Um, and my rule is this, OK? So I fix this. And then I say I'm going to do this test. I'm going to look at p. I'm going to compute the p-value. And if it's less than alpha, like this, I'm going to reject the h0. Now, if h0 is true, t will be standard normal. So t can still be above here with some probability. It's only that it happens with a low probability. So t is greater than uh, set alpha with probability alpha. So even if h0 is true, it might just happen that I get my t up here. It's not very likely, but it can happen. And if I put the sort of limit here, it will actually happen with this probability. I could be more, even more afraid of making type 1 error, then I would put alpha to 0 0.01, for instance. Okay, Then I would put my limit somewhere here, corresponding to, yeah, corresponding to the alpha equal to 0 0.01. So that means my rule of decision would lead to a type 1 mistake in one, statistically, one out of 100 experiments that I do. So I'm going to be right 99% of the time if I have this rule. OK. So this might have been kind of airy at the end of the day, but um, I don't want to go into more detail about exactly this connection here. But uh, the alpha, or it says here, alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. That's important to, to have in mind. And this also tells you I'm probably off. Why don't we set alpha equal to 0? So we never make a type 1 error. That would be nice. But the only problem is you would only reject H0 in case that you have a negative or, say, 100% 0 p value. So you would put your limit for accepting or for rejecting H0 so far out. So you would never be able to reject any H0. So you need to allow this little, little amount of allowance to, to errors to make this work. Yeah. OK, we can do, we can do the two first here, I think. So now I did some fairly theoretical things. I told you the main ingredients here. Here's a little bit more practically how to compute in a few cases. Um, so we'll do A, and this is not in any particular setting. It's just theoretical. H0 says maybe equal to 25. Well, maybe I don't have to do it on the blackboard because it's in the, in the notes there anyway. I'll do only some drawings here, I guess. Um, OK, so we sample 50. We find um, x bar equal to 24.8. And we find standard deviation is 1.1. And we like to set alpha equal to 0 0.05.
So let's draw a picture on the original scale of the hypothesis. OK, let's put up. So, and then we'll put a Vs between. So this is H1. Um, so the magical value here is 25. That's what this claims. And this claims it's that the mu is less. So from this, we see that critical direction must be downwards here. We need to observe x bars somewhat to the left of 25 to at least have some evidence of this one. And then the question is, how far does it need to go before we change our view? And it happens to be here at 24.8. So it's a little bit below. But we don't know at this moment if this is strong or weak or whatever. So we set alpha equal to 0 0.05. And then the question is, do this test based on this sample data? That means, in our case, find the p-value and decide whether we should reject H0. So let's look at the solution. Um, Yeah, so you take x bar, you subtract the value from from here. This is what we call mu zero often, and we divide by s over the standard over the square root of the sample size. Um, okay, so you get to more critical. I decided it was to the left, so it's going to be to the left on the down the normal scale also. So this is critical direction. Um, and we need to define that because this is what um, determines how we compute the p-value. The p-value is the probability of more critical. So we need to know the critical direction. Uh, and once we've done that, we just find the, well, I see I call this set in this case. In the text, I call it t, but it's the same thing. It's something that is now standard normal. It's the test that statistic. So you do your computation. You just insert in this expression the observed x bar, subtract 25 divide by 1.1 over the square root of 50 and arrive, if I compute it correctly, at minus 1.28. So here is minus 1, minus 2, but m minus 1.28 is there. And our intuition, or if we have some feeling for the standard normal, we would see that this is not very critical. I mean, it's not very striking regarding this distribution. Now you can go to your tables, or you can use Excel, or you can use your calculator, probably, to compute the p-value, which is then this. Take your observation and find the probability of being anything worse off than that. And you find it's about 0 0.10. And our rule was that the p should be very low, at least lower than the alpha. And it's not. So we keep h0. Uh, yeah, so what does this mean? Well, it simply means that this sample data gives no strong evidence of this one. So to st state it in a different way, this value here, it means that if we sample from a situation where this is true, 
every 10 sample would give me some outcome like this or even more extreme or uh, more to the left than this. So this happens 10% of the sample, so it's not unusual at all. That's why we don't reject H0 in a, in a different setting. OK. Um, let's Let me just give you the very highlights of this final, or this B example here. Uh, because this is what we call a two-sided test. So the alternative is now not an inequality, but it's, or it's two inequalities in a way. So it looks like this. Um, now, before we look at the sample, let's see what's going on here. So we're going to look, of course, at x bar. And then we're going to look at uh, s. And we need the sample size. And we need the alpha to decide the test. And once we have those, we are in some chance of making it. But the first thing we need to note is that we have a two-sided alternative. So if my x bar is sufficiently far up this way, I'm going to reject H0. But also, if it's sufficiently far down that, that way. So I have two cri critical or critical direction is in both ways. So this uh, goes over to my, this picture I'm drawing all the time. I should have just a stamp. Make a standard normal. But it means I also get the critical direction for my, what I call, set or t here. Uh, probably. Huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I call it also set here. So set observation up here is critical in a way. But I would say that this one is even more critical than that one. Huh? While if this is minus a, then this is equally critical as that one, just because the critical is in both sides. So it has simply the consequence that when we compute the p-value here, we look at the set observed. But now we cannot only take that piece, because we have to also add the probability of being critical on the other side. So to make a short or a half short history shorter, this is what I said in the definition of the critical. Then calculate the set ops here. So the x bar was 297.5 from a sample of 250. And the standard deviation was 14.2. And then we have everything we need. So if I can. So our set observed is minus 2.78. Here somewhere is 0. And OK, we know that plus minus 2 standard deviation is where things happen in a standard normal. So this is something striking in a way. So the distribution itself would sit 
something like this. And then to compute the exact p-value, you take the probability of being lower than this, but also uh, include the probability of being on this side critical. And then you get simply two times any of these outside probabilities. Uh, so like this, for instance. This is the idea that this, this distribution is symmetric. So you only need to compute one of them, but you need to include two times because it's on that side and it's on that side. So using your favorite computation tool here, you find this probability on one side and multiply by two, you get this p-value. And anyway, this is way below um, the chosen alpha. So again, you reject um, H0. So that's the difference with a you know, one-sided that kind of a critical direction that way or this way, but the two-sided alternative use both ways. And I said solution to C. C is an example from the compendium, but I don't think time permits at all. And I don't think you would permit me either. So we'll just stop there. Shut down the...